Hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, David Feidler, and I'm the editor of the Stoic Insights website, and I'm also the author of the book Breakfast with Seneca, A Stoic Guide to the Art of Living. And you can read about both the book and the website uh, at the link below this video. And today, I'm pleased to have as my guest, William B. Irvine, a professor of philosophy at Wright State University. But uh, he's best known to uh, many of us as the author of several influential books on Stoicism. And uh, Bill is the author of the book On Desire, Why We Want What We Want. He's the author of A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy, and uh, most recently, The Stoic Challenge, A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, calmer, and more resilient. So uh, welcome, Bill. It's uh, fantastic to have a chance to finally speak with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Well, uh, today we're going to discuss uh, basically themes from all three of the books I mentioned. We're going to discuss how to overcome fame, fortune, and setbacks, uh, which tie your books together. And, and uh, if you'd like someone to blame uh, for the emergence of modern Stoicism, William Irvine is probably uh, most responsible for the rebirth of Stoicism as a modern form of philosophy. And uh, it's great to uh, be able to speak with you finally, uh, not only because of your work, which I love, and the sense of humor uh, you bring to your work as well, uh, but now I've spoken uh, on Stoic Insights uh, with uh, Donald Robertson, John Sellers, Massimo Pellucci, and now you. So that's all four horsemen of the Stoic apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be riding with that crowd. So, And um, I should have probably started with you first because uh, your book, A Guide to the Good Life, was the first book on Stoicism as a modern philosophy that got a huge number of uh, general readers interested in Stoicism. So uh, could you tell us... Uh, how you became interested in Stoicism in the very beginning before you even started writing A Guide to the Good Life. Okay, so um, this was apparently some kind of low-grade midlife crisis I was having. I decided I was going to be a, a Zen Buddhist, uh, and then the thing I needed to do was learn more about uh, Zen. And uh, so I undertook a, a kind of a personal research project on that. And then being uh, an academic, well, we professors, our, our pay raises and, and things like that are affected by publications. So I thought, uh, you know, um, I can uh, turn this into a, a twofer. That is two for the price of one. I can not only do the personal research I want to do anyway, but I can maybe turn this into a book. And the book uh, is the book that uh, ultimately became On Desire, Why We Want What We Want. And in doing the research, so I had to broaden out. So I decided one of the things I was going to do is put a Zen into a broader context of, of different advice that's been offered on how to have a, a good life. And uh, along the way, stumbled across the Stoics as uh, people who had given different advice on how to have a good life. I had actually already encountered the Stoics. I was a philosophy major. Uh, but I didn't encounter them in any normal philosophy course. I encountered them in a logic course because it turns out they were the preeminent logicians of the first century uh, BCE. Uh, and uh, they uh, specialized in the kind of logic that makes your, your cell phone work. Uh, and that is propositional logic, uh, if then and 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 or. Um, so you should be grateful uh, for what they've done. They uh, laid the, the, the groundwork there. Um, and that's where I encountered them. But in my regular, what I would call my regular philosophy classes, there was no mention of them. In fact, there was a feeling that a proper philosopher won't concern himself with this idea of how to have a good life. There are all these technical issues that we should concern ourselves with instead. There are these questions that people have been asking for 2,000 years without really having an answer. But but any day now, any day now, we're going to stumble across that uh, answer. Uh, and uh, But being introduced to this other side of Stoicism, it, it struck me that, first of all, they were aimed at the same kind of grand goal 
in living as uh, Zen Buddhists were. And that is, uh, and it, whatever word you choose, you're going to get in trouble for it. But the, the word I chose was tranquility. And I define tranquility not as a zombie-like state, but the relative absence of negative emotions from your life and the presence of positive emotions. So negative emotions, how, how, how do you know they're, they're negative? They feel bad. They're things like anger, uh, uh, regret, uh, envy, uh, grief, things that feel bad. Positive emotions, feelings of delight, uh, feelings of joy, a sense of awe. Those are positive emotions. And they said, you know, but what you want to do is arrange your life so that the positive emotions are increased. You, you, uh, you can experience feelings of delight at the drop of a hat. If, you, if you're in that category, you're in great shape. And then it wasn't that you stifle the negative emotions. It's that you prevent them occurring to begin with. And that when they do occur, you have strategies for nipping them in the bud so they can't can take, take control of your mind. Uh, they can ruin your days and they can also prevent you from sleeping so they ruin your nights uh, as well. And then to realize uh, that Zen Buddhists have that same goal in mind, just a radically different way to pursue it. So the practical strategy of how do we get to that goal. And Zen Buddhists would say, well, you meditate. You do a bunch of things, but you meditate. Okay, so then what happens? Well, you have ultimately your moment of enlightenment. Okay, when? Will it be like next Wednesday? Well, it could be tomorrow, and it could be in 30 years, right? And the Stoics, on the other hand, said you don't meditate, at least not in the sense that Zen Buddhists uh, say you, you meditate. Uh, they uh, said, instead, there's some practical psychological strategies you can use in everyday living. And if you use them, you will notice a dramatic decline in the number of negative emotions you experience and an increase in the number of positive emotions. So I came out of that book thinking, ah, well, okay, I want to be a Stoic because it's really really wonderful stuff. And compared to Zen Buddhism, it has a low cost of entry. To test drive Stoicism, my standard line is you can do that on a three-day weekend. You can learn enough about it and give the strategies a try and find out whether they're going to work in your life or not. And whereas Zen Buddhism, and if you're a Zen Buddhist, this isn't a put down. Uh, I've been told by Henry Shukman, who's a Zen authority, that you can do both, that they aren't incompatible, uh, you know, and in fact, that they complement each other uh, nicely. Um, but, but there's just a bigger price of admission. You know, there will be a lot of time spent meditating. Uh, uh, and it's, it's a long-term project and might work for you, probably will have uh, some impact. Um, but, uh, but if you want the goods quick, quickly, then stoicism is at least a place to try. Because uh, the worst that can happen is you set yourself a few days behind in your search for the ultimate truth. Right. Um, well, uh, one thing that we have in common, uh, I used to be a philosophy professor too. And of course, uh, in my training as uh, a philosophy professor, I never once <clears throat> was exposed to uh, stoicism in uh, the classroom. But of course, I studied uh, ancient Greek philosophy, so I was exposed through my own studies. But um, it's amazing how uh, the interest has grown in stoicism, and part of that is due to uh, you know your your book, A Guide to the Good Life, but. Um, Going back to your book on desire, uh, you investigate the uh, question of fame and fortune and why fame and fortune uh, go together. And I'm wondering if uh, you could explain that to our listeners, because I found that to be very interesting. And it also relates, uh, relates to some things that Seneca had to say. Yeah, we, uh, we humans are social animals. Uh, and what we seek is uh, we form tribes to begin with, and you can have overlapping uh, multiple tribes that you belong to. But um, within our tribes, we uh, seek a standing. We want to rise in the, in the level of our, in the eyes of our fellow tribes members. Why is that? Well, it's wired into us because our ancestors 
uh, you know, uh, 70,000, uh, 200,000 years ago savan- on the savannas of Africa, if you weren't a member of a tribe, you were something's lunch. You were gone and you dropped out of the uh, evolutionary equation. And if you were a member of a tribe, the question of uh, when you ate and whether you mated were a question of your uh, place in the, in the tribe. So one of the, you know, you, you have wired into you these, uh, uh, the, these desires, these needs, like you get thirsty. Uh, uh, so what do you do? You drink water, you get hungry, you eat food. Uh, you feel sexual desire, you act on uh, sexual uh, desire. But in much the same way, you feel driven to number one, have human contact, and number two, among the humans you come into contact with, you want to rise in status among those that are in your tribe. And the thing is, we no longer live on the savannas of, of, of Africa, so we've been trained uh, for an environment that, that just is utterly unlike the environment we're in. And but we we have that it's wired into us, and it you know give, give us a, another few hundred thousand years, and the wiring could slowly change, so we no longer feel this way. But right now, we want to impress others, uh, so we're interested in the two quick words are fame and fortune, but it's all a relative thing. So fortune counts as what? Uh, well, it can count as having a hundred billion dollars, but you know the real big issue is you have more than the other people in your tribe do. And then um, fame is uh, also uh, just your, your standing, your, uh, that they look up to you, that they admire you, and then secretly that they envy you. That's absolutely wonderful. Envy is one of the worst of the negative emotions, um, but if they, if they uh, envy you. And so one way you can trigger envy is with fame. Uh, so I argue in uh, On Desire that the reason people seek uh, fortune is primarily because of the fame it will give them. And I, I do in a thought experiment. Imagine you're in a world where uh, you can get anything you want. You can drive any car you want. Uh, you can live anywhere you want. Uh, and that's because you're the only person on the planet. So you know what? Hey, I'm living in the White House. (laughs) There's nobody to stop me. Uh, But you're going to be a miserable human being because there's nobody to impress. So it isn't just the stuff, you know, and and people who have the, you know, the expensive watches and all the others displays of of wealth. um, They only want those because they may not realize this, but they only want those because uh, they want to, to impress other people. And it's, it's one way to do that. Um, and then you look at the various philosophies for having a good life that have been developed, and they're clear. You know what? You don't want to impress a whole bunch of people. There are a tiny handful of people that you should care very much about what they think about you. And then there's a whole bunch of people you should say, you know what? They're just playing a different game than I am. So if they disapprove, well, they're playing a different game. You know, it's like somebody who's playing uh, ice hockey, you know, criticizing somebody who's playing tennis. You know, you should use one of these big, long <laughs> sticks like we have. Well, no, no, you're playing a different game. So, um, and there should be people, I call them anti-mentors, that if they approve of what you're doing, it <laughs> means you're doing something very wrong. Right, you you got to right. stop doing that. You, you, have to, you have to earn their disapproval that that would be a sign of uh, progress. Right. Well, um, before we started uh, recording this conversation, we were talking privately about how uh, Seneca was uh, so amazing because he was really a proto-psychologist and he understood many of these uh, issues Um, more more so than anyone uh, up until the modern day. And uh, one of the things that he said repeatedly is that uh, what makes wealth compelling for people is that they're then able to display their affluence to others. Uh, So it's that desire for social status. And he he repeats that several times um, throughout his uh, writings. But I have a quote from Seneca that I want to share because it just goes to show how little has changed in the last 2000 years because what he's describing here uh, is basically uh, the culture of Hollywood celebrities and how they want to be 
uh, the focal point of attention throughout their entire lives. And <clears throat> so this is from, from one of Seneca's letters. He says, uh, self-indulgent people want to be the focus of attention throughout their entire lives. Should the gossip go silent, they feel badly and will do something new to arouse notoriety. Many of them drop large, large sums of money and many keep mistresses. To make a name for yourself in this crowd, you need to combine extravagance with notoriety. In such a busy town, ordinary vices don't get reported. Yeah, and uh, he had it easy because we're doing that on steroids now. And um, the whole uh, social uh, media, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and everything else, uh, I'm convinced it's had a, a, an astonishing impact on people, on the values of people, on the way people live their lives. Because now they're out to impress. Who is it? Is it their neighbors? No. Is it their coworkers? No. Uh, it's uh, ideally 10,000, 100,000, a million complete strangers who will very quickly give you feedback. And they'll give you uh, see, I, I stay away from social media because I'm afraid of, uh, of what it would do to me. So, so uh, this is, I, I'm not the most well-informed person, but they'll, they'll give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. They'll become a follower that, and you go through the different metrics. They provide you with these metrics on how you're doing. And then you got to keep raising your game or you're going to lose them to somebody else who's raising uh, their game. Uh, one uh, show I saw, maybe on, uh, maybe on Netflix, somewhere, uh, but it was, I think it's called uh, Fake Famous, and they take five people out of the crowd, and then each tries to get their group of followers, right? So they can become an influence, influencers. You can make a, lo a living doing that. And, um, um, and then they have all sorts of trickery they do to make it, to, to make it look like they're rich without being rich because they want right. to trigger <laughs> admiration or ideally envy right. in other human beings. Uh, and it's just a crazy game. You're letting complete strangers call the shots in this, the one life you have to live. You're letting, you're letting them control what you do when you get up how you spend your money, what you spend your money on, because they will approve of you. Oh, by the way, the approval can go in an instant. It can turn into a, an avalanche of an, of an attack. So it's a, a dangerous game to be playing. Uh, Stoic would say, you know what? Most people, I don't care what they think. I really don't care what they think. And if they, if they disapprove of me, well, within realms, I'll listen to the criticism. But a lot of times, you know, I can just shrug it off. They're playing a different game. Uh, now, I can keep this to myself. It's a really stupid game that they're playing. I'm not going not gonna to announce that. But, but uh, they think the game I'm playing is, is uh, probably a really stupid game. You know, I'm just uh, trying to find ways to, for instance, intensely enjoy the bark on a tree, right? Because, you know, most people, it's just there. But, but if you start learning about the bark on a tree and the different forms it takes and the moss that grows on that and the bugs that live in that, that can be an incredible thing to be thinking about. But they'd say, well, that's just crazy. That's just stupid. You should want. And then they start naming wristwatches that I don't, <laughs> I don't know about and everything else. Okay, let's each just play our game and, and call it even. Right. Well, I do use social media sometimes, but uh, lately it's becoming become more and more difficult for me to actually log on. And I find that the less time I'm exposed to it, the happier I am. So um, now in one or two of your books, you mentioned this idea of a hedonic adaptation or okay. the hedonic treadmill, um, which is um, why people are never satisfied with the things that they actually have. And I was wondering if you could explain to us what that is. Okay. And before we do that, just a comment about your last comment is I know I'm in a minority in, in, uh, in staying away from social media, but here's a challenge for anybody who is on, you know, it's your life. You decide how you're going to live it. Um, give yourself a test. Try to go for 24 hours without it. And at the end of that 24 hours, you, it, it might be a, a profound revelation for you 
And you might realize that it actually isn't that you want to be there. It's that there's an addiction that's formed. You know, if somebody came up to me and said, well, I don't have a drinking problem. And I said, well, okay, don't drink for 24 hours. Let's go on a hike in the forest, right? (laughs) And so, uh, you know, you might say, I want to do it. But in fact, you can't help that. Um, So uh, even what I've got going is uh, a little bit scary for me because I find that I'm now monitoring my cell phone with the care that I used to monitor my infant children. You know, you're always on alert and, and, oh, it just made a noise. And what does that noise mean? Uh, it's having an, an impact on uh, on my life, I know. And and so it's it's just one of those things. There are things that feel real good, and that's why you got to watch out for them. If they felt bad, there'd be no problem, but they feel good. And drugs do feel good at the beginning, and later on they start feeling bad. But back to hedonic adaptation. Um, so uh, uh, I like to think in terms of what I call the gap theory of happiness. So most people are unhappy because there's a gap. Now, here's where I do a visual demonstration. There's a gap between what they have and what they want, okay? And uh, they realize there's a gap there, and they think that if only I could fill that gap, then I would at last be happy. And so how do you fill the gap? Well, you work really hard to get the thing that you want. Oh, look at that. The gap disappeared, okay? Okay. And the question, do they live happily ever after? And the answer is no, because a new gap appears above the old gap. Uh, suddenly, I mean, they're sitting there. Yeah, you know, when the gap's finally filled, they, they spend uh, hours or maybe even days just thinking, ah, life is grand. And then they'll be sitting there uh, minding their own business when they'll notice an intrusive thought, a thought about some friend who has just bought a new car and it's really a neat new car. It just does incredible things. Um, And then, oops, there's a gap. If you monitor your own desires, you'll realize you didn't choose to have those desires. Those desires appeared within you from deep sources. So we were talking about Zen. Uh, uh, If you don't become a Zen Buddhist, you should at least try a meditation. Uh, Devote five minutes of your life to what's called a Zazen meditation. What do you do? Uh, You sit in a quiet place and empty your mind of thoughts. And it can be a life-changing five minutes. Costs you nothing to do, right? Uh, uh, But it can be a life-changing five minutes because you will realize that your mind has a mind of its own. And you'll be sitting there trying to have uh, no thoughts at all. And then suddenly you'll start thinking about uh, something somebody said to you. And you'll be angry about that. And you realize, oops, I'm doing meditation. I'm going to push that idea out. Then you're thinking about, hmm, what am I going to have for dinner tonight anyway? Uh, So a lot of them are desires. A lot of them are regrets. There's a whole bunch of things going on in you. So when you say, I want something, or even worse, I need something, uh, because need is just your way of saying, I want it so bad that you should have to give it to me, or society, or somebody somewhere. But in in most cases, you didn't decide to want that. The want appeared within you. Okay, so anyway, we have this gap theory where I'm unhappy because there's a gap. Oh, good. I got what I wanted. That feels fine. Oops, new gap. And so you can go through your life working through that process over and over. Uh, the other analogy is you're, you're like a person on the desert, right? It's 120 degrees. You haven't had water. You see off in the distance there in the sand, you see what looks like a pond. You see what looks like shimmering water. So you cross two miles of desert and you get there to realize that it was just a mirage. And now you're actually thirstier than you were before. But oh, look over there in the distance, there's another pond and you go to, to get it, to get the water. And it's just another mirage. So a lot of people um, chase mirages through their lives, end up not only penniless, but even worse, deep in debt because they kept thinking this next hit, that'll be the one that does it for me. I'll live happily ever after, after that one, but it doesn't work that way. So quick follow-up. 
Stoics and Zen Buddhists alike realized that there's a plan B when there's a gap between what you have and what you want. There's another way to close that gap, and that is, ooh, want the thing you already have. The thing you already have is incredibly valuable. It's something, it's something that at one time in your life you wanted really bad, and now you've got it. And the thing is, you've just come to take it for granted. And so that's why this new gap arose. And you know what? It's going to be a lot easier to get because you've already got it. Um, so that's the advice both a Zen Buddhist and a Stoic would give you. If you want to be a happy person, don't keep chasing rainbows or mirages. Uh, just learn how to love and embrace and appreciate the things you've already got. Right. Actually, Marcus Aurelius um, mentions uh, what you said explicitly. Um, and uh, this hedonic uh, treadmill, uh, it's sort of like the shiny object syndrome. So people are attracted to shiny objects and then they get them. And then after a while, they're not as shiny anymore. So they want to go out and find a new shiny object. Um, and I was really astonished when I was uh, researching the Seneca book because as I mentioned to you, Seneca actually uh, mentions uh, hedonic adaptation, uh, I think two or three times throughout his writings. And I have this one quote, he says, this was in Natural Questions, and he's uh, writing to uh, his friend uh, Lucilius. And he says, uh, don't you see that everything loses its force once it becomes familiar? So people take things for granted. And there's this wonderful, uh, one, one of the, uh, Emotions, which has been overlooked in Stoicism, actually is gratitude. And all of the Roman Sto Stoics write about it to a, a large extent. <clears throat> so maybe we can talk about that later on. But uh, I just want to mention this uh, quotation from Marcus Aurelius. And he says that uh, instead of imagining that you have something that you would like to have and it's now in your presence, instead of doing that, look actually at what you do have and be grateful for that. So that's exactly what you said. Yeah, now the phrase hedonic adaptation, this was late in the uh, 20th century when modern psychology finally caught up to the insights that uh, the, the Stoics had in the first century BCE. So it's uh, they were uh, pioneers in, in coming up with these concepts, uh, and only lately has psychology caught up with them. Absolutely. That's also true of gratitude, uh, because uh, I have a chapter on love and gratitude in this book, and I did quite a bit of research into the contemporary psychology of uh, gratitude. And it's only now that people are coming around to understand how important it is where the Stoics and, uh, you know, actually other uh, religious traditions always place qu quite a bit of emphasis on that. But um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your book, The Good Life, and the story is is that uh, about 12 years ago, I was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I walked into a Barnes & Noble, and there in the philosophy section was the cover of your book. It was face out on display, this very beautiful uh, cover. I'll place an image of it on the video. Okay. Uh, and I was just astonished because... Um, I studied ancient philosophy. I was a philosophy professor, but I was amazed to see a book on Stoicism for a popular audience. In other words, uh, a book on philosophy for normal people. And it was on Stoicism as well. So I was just astonished uh, by that. And uh, that was around the same time I started uh, reading Seneca as well. And one of the things I really, really liked about The Good Life is that part in the very beginning of the book where you explain what a philosophy of life is and why it might actually be important for someone to have one. And I was wondering if uh, you could uh, tell us a bit about that. Um, so your days are filled with forming goals and with meeting goals you've already formed. That's an ongoing activity. Uh, many of them are tiny goals, like what am I going to have for breakfast uh, this uh, this morning? Um, then, you know, you go through the process of, of meeting that goal and then you form a new goal. Um, and you, it's easy to go through an entire life just always thinking in terms of short-term goals. Uh, philosophy of life says, okay, yeah, you got all these goals, 
But what's your grand goal in living? That's a, a different way of putting it. What's your grand goal? What is it you're trying to get out of life? What would make your life a successful life? You can tell me what would make breakfast a successful breakfast and what would make today a successful day. But what would make your life a successful life? And most people don't give this a moment's thought. And yet it should be um, the very first thing they do when they're capable of having a uh, deep thought. And that is, uh, so what is this all about? Where am I headed in life? Why should I pick one goal rather than uh, the other? Um, and I told you earlier that the Zen Buddhists and the Epicureans and the Stoics and the Cynics and the Skeptics, you go through a bunch of different groups, seem to have come up with this same uh, notion. And that is, well, it's a mind that lives uh, at ease, a mind that is full of these positive emotions and that is relatively free of negative emotions. Yeah, well, what if I'm uh, hungry and don't have good stuff? Well, you know, if your mind's at ease, no big deal. Um, um, uh, so th there was a, a kind of a agreement ab about that. Um, so that is one thing you should do. Most people say, oh, what's my grand goal in living? Well, to be, to be uh, rich and famous, mm -hmm. right? Well, why do you want that? Well, look around you. It's what everybody else wants. And it's, it's one of these things where you suspect, you go through life just looking at what other people are doing. You look at the game they're playing. You study the rules. You look at what the goals are. And you assume that surely somebody somewhere has done their homework on this. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the case that everybody's playing the same game. When in fact, uh, nobody's done their homework. Uh, what we're all doing is just, um, it's, we're wired to behave this way. And we're wired for stupid evolutionary reasons in, in that people who played this game 100,000 years ago were more likely to have offspring to survive and have offspring than we are now. But it's a really crazy game to play and you don't have to play it. Uh, remember, you've got one life to live. Now, we can talk about heaven, we can talk about other, other things which raise a bunch of interesting questions. But while you're on earth at any rate, you've got one life to live. And the primary danger, uh, and this is uh, a word that I semi-invented in uh, in, uh, 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 let's see, an on desire, and that is, or a guide to the good life, I guess, that you mislive. You got one life to live. You got one opportunity. And wouldn't it be a shame to realize that you blew it? You spent it on that hedonic treadmill. You spent it chasing shiny things. And now you, you've used up that life. And, and that's all you've got is a pile of things that are no longer shiny, a pile of painful and unpleasant memories. Um, and, uh, the, the beauty is there is a plan B for all of that. There is another way to go. Uh, you're going to start behaving in ways that many people won't understand. Uh, you're going to become an outlier in some sense, but why try to impress somebody who's playing a different and don't tell them this, a stupid game, uh, come up with your own game and play it well. Right. Um, there's this really great uh, quote from Seneca where he's actually talking about the modern phenomenon. Uh, it's just amazing how nothing has changed in 2000 years, but he's talking about keeping up with the Joneses. Yep. And I have uh, the short quote about that. It's just too funny uh, not to share. And he says, uh, how many things we acquire only because others bought them and because they are in a good many homes. Many of our problems are explained by the fact that we copy the example of others. Rather than following reason, we are led astray by convention. If only a few people did something, we wouldn't imitate them. But when the majority starts to act a certain way, we follow along too, as if something should be more honorable just because it's more frequent. So that's funny. But um, I really like your idea of uh, misliving. And uh, in your discussion of that in The Good Life, you, you, you say that you don't want to end up on your deathbed and then have, having a feeling of regret that uh, you wasted your life in some way and you didn't do something more meaningful. And um, one of the things uh, that I discovered is that uh, Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, they all talk about gratitude, 
but they, it's, it's very astonishing. Um, they all have this idea that when you're facing death, you should actually, uh, rather than feeling regret, you should uh, feel a sense of gratitude for the life that the universe has given you. So that's a much better uh, way to leave life than uh, with a feeling of regret or resentment or the fact that you've just wasted your life, that you've mislived it. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. I'm I'm uh, people have have informed me that I'm I'm getting older. So uh, uh, so I'm I'm kind of facing a retirement here, and in conjunction with that, uh, you know, I had to think. Okay, do I have enough um, money to have a comfortable retirement? Uh, which meant I had to look at actuarial tables to see my expected uh, lifespan, and uh, w- which is a bit of an eye opener because it's easy to go through life imagining, well, you know, I'm I'm the lucky one, I'm immortal, <laughs> you know, it's it's never going to catch up to me, and then realize, nah, you have uh, X number of years to live, meaning you have Y number of days to live, and you can either take that to be a tragic state of affairs, what an unfair universe that it should be that way. Or you can turn that around and you can say, that makes my days meaningful. That means that each day I spend, there will be X minus one less days for me to live. Therefore, the days I have, uh, I should appreciate. I should suck the value out of them. I should embrace them. Um, so we talked a little bit be, um, about heaven before. I think most people are going to be absolutely miserable in heaven. Uh, number one, uh, if they take their earthly personalities with them to heaven, they'll still be playing the hedonic treadmill game. You know, They'll still be chasing mirages. Only in heaven... It won't be. I only have X days left to live. Uh, The value of X will be infinity. And so it'll be so easy to wake up each morning and just do nothing. I mean, assuming we have mornings and days in heaven and just do nothing, knowing, you know, I haven't lost anything. And you could spend infinity of wasted time, which seems like a huge uh, waste. So uh, I'm a big fan of the movie Groundhog Day. Uh, and, you know, you watch Bill Murray go through the stages and then there's uh, there's this one stage where he realizes where he's just absolutely miserable, realizing that he has uh, an uncountable number of days left to him. And so he can waste them. He can get drunk before breakfast. And that's a perfectly acceptable uh, way to um, proceed. Uh, the alternative is each day you're given. I mean, I, uh, I try to make a point of this when I wake up in the morning and realize, oh, I'm still in my bedroom. Oh, my glasses are where I left them. Isn't that grand? I get another day of life. Well, and even that's a bit presumptuous. I get another start of another day in life, and uh, I'm going to do my best to make this a good one. And so whatever number of days are left, they're going to be quality days to the extent that I can make them that way. And yet you look around uh, at people and they are just, um, they're in a rut and they, they're assuming they have uh, infinitely many. So yeah, I might waste today. I might waste tomorrow, but, but it's okay. It's okay. Uh, 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 you, don't, you don't want to end up with regrets about the life you had it in your power to, to live that you failed to live. So take steps to avoid that. Right. Uh, you're, you were actually one of the first uh, writers to um, point out that the stoic practice of the premeditation of adversity often res- results in a feeling of gratitude and even uh, memento mori, remembering your own mortality. And I've experimented with both of those quite a bit. And uh, I had a really profound experience uh, picking my son up at school during the pandemic, which was very bad here in Sarajevo. And he came out, he was wearing his mask. We walked across the street. I was holding his small hand. I could feel the warmth of it. And um, I thought about the fact that, uh, you know, at some point one of us is going to die. So we have a finite period of time together. And rather than making me, me that making me feel unhappy It made me feel a profound sense of gratitude for the time that we uh, do have together. Uh, So it's interesting how those uh, stoic 
uh, sort of like psychological techniques can make you feel gratitude for what you actually have. Yeah, they're they're cheap and easy. Uh, you know, I can teach it to you in five minutes. I call it negative visualization. Uh, and you can try it and, and you're, it costs you zero and no one's, you can do it in private. No one's going to ridicule you for doing it. Uh, so what you do is you, you simply, uh, think for a second about, uh, what it is in life you value. And then you think about, uh, losing the thing that you value. Now, the key thing is you don't dwell on that because that would be uh, a recipe for a miserable existence. That would be step one of a slide into a suicidal state of mind. So you don't dwell on that. You allow yourself to have what I call a flickering thought about it. You know, just a realization, this is here and it doesn't have to be here. Uh, and then go about life as normal. And I find routinely, and I've been doing this for, uh, for uh, what, a decade and a half, two decades, uh, it's, a, it's an immediate effect of just me appreciating and not taking uh, for granted. Um, yeah, so I have a, a thing that I do. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in a long-term successful relationship, uh, uh, had the same wife forever. And um, one of the things I do is, is periodically I imagine that this woman was no longer a part of my life. And, uh, and she knows I've been doing it because she'll hear me yell from another room, thanks for existing, honey, right? In other words, it's so easy to take the existence of other people utterly for granted and to assume, yeah, I don't have to be nice to them or talk to them or do anything because there will always be tomorrow. Well, there won't always be tomorrow. Um, so uh, there's a last time for everything. And, and, you know, you look at, you might say, yeah, but I'm poor. Ah, you could be poorer. Just imagine the life of if you were dirt a uh, floor poor where you were so poor that you had a hut where it didn't even have a regular floor. It was just dirt and there'd be bugs crawling around. Oh, well, yeah. Well, if I was there, that would be the, no, no, no. Imagine you didn't even have a hut. Imagine you're exposed to the weather outside. Yeah. Well, okay. If I was that, that would be the bomb. No. Imagine that you were blind, right? And then you start laying on all of these things you have and take utterly for granted. So um, doing um, live audience kinds of things, one of the things I like to do if I'm introducing them uh, to Stoicism is we do negative uh, visualization. That uh, what I do is I say, okay, I, uh, I want you uh, to imagine uh, being blind and to help you do that, I want you to all close your eyes, right? Uh, and I say, uh, now I want you to imagine that that's what the rest of your life would be. And lately I've got a slight twist on that, you know, so wait a minute until everybody's getting a little bit nervous about what's happening. I say, okay, now I want you to imagine, I don't want you to open them, but I, am, I want you to imagine that when you attempt to open them, they're glued shut and they won't open and that's how it's going to be forever. You know what? When they do open their eyes again and see the world around them, there's this rush that comes in and this realization that I have taken this utterly for granted my entire life. And it's absolutely huge. Is it better than a designer purse? Is it better than a 50 or 60 or $100,000 car? Oh, yeah. Because if I gave you the choice between those you would do it. And yet you've had it and you have it. So you take it for granted. Um, that sense of gratitude of simply being alive. And, you know, there are a lot of people who like to play the, the role of victim. And for them, it's, well, I don't have everything I want. So you should feel sorry for me. Or they'll state it in terms of needs. I have unmet needs. And so you should feel sorry for me. Uh, and, you know, it's just so easy to say, okay, guess what? You're living better with your unmet needs than pick the number of billions, but it's probably at least 2 billion, maybe more like 6 billion people on the planet have it worse than you do in any kind of metric you want to pick. And so you're telling me that, that I should feel sorry for you. I refuse to do it. You're, you're actually well off. You should be trying to help those people who are worse off. Uh, 
Yeah. So it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, and, and, you know, when you try to tell somebody who thinks they're, uh, they're a victim, if you try to tell them, no, you actually have it really well off historically. I mean, this is another way. Don't even think about the population of the planet now. Uh, if you can find the diaries of your great, great, great grandparents, uh, you will find it tragic reading, you know, three of their kids died, you know, when they were young, how come? Well, they didn't have antibiotics, you know, um, the water, you know, they had to walk to get the water and so on. Uh, and if they could look at your miserable modern existence, you who have an outmoded cell phone, if they could look at that, they would think, this person is living in a dream world. Um, right. But to you, it isn't. The fact that people take things for granted, that's another example of uh, hedonic adaptation. Because yes. it's like you get a new piece of technology, say like a microwave oven, and then after uh, you've had it for a couple of months, you think, oh, I could have, I could never live without that. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and uh, cell phones, uh, which, you know, now, like I told you, I carry around and nurture. And, and uh, well, let's see, I went through the first 50 years of my life without that, uh, you know, uh, dr driving across the country. There would be times when you simply had no phone. And if your car stopped, your car stopped. And you, you, would you get help? Well, maybe some passing. That was only 20 years ago that that was the case right. and now yeah. you know now you're kind of checking and it's telling you the directions and and if you didn't get in trouble you you call so we take that for granted right well your book the stoic challenge is i think um, maybe my most favorite book of yours because it's based on just a few simple ideas uh, but it's very practical because it shows the reader how they can use uh, these basic practices from stoic philosophy to become uh, more resilient and develop their characters when they face setbacks. <clears throat> so I personally enjoyed this book quite a bit, but um, it's very beautifully written and clear. And um, I, I have a feeling about it too, that it would maybe make a very good gift uh, that you could give to someone who doesn't know anything about stoicism or doesn't even care about stoicism, because I think a lot of people uh, in today's world would actually find this to be helpful. So, uh, could you tell us a bit about what this book is uh, actually about? Um, so Guide to the Good Life was an introduction to uh, Stoicism, to the ancient Stoic philosophers, to the notion of a philosophy of life, to uh, uh, the strategy. So it was a broad, a general uh, introduction. Uh, subsequent to that, I wrote a book called A Slap in the Face, which was applied stoicism. So it's when somebody insults you, how should you respond? And I talk about a lot of things, the psychology of insults, the whole, the whole social status game. Uh, but the, the big thing is how, how would stoics say we should respond? Uh, and as the stoics were really good, they said, you know what, make it into a joke. Uh, it's the best comeback. If somebody has attempted to insult you, they just hit you with, with what they think was a knockdown punch. And if you just laugh, they look like an idiot, right? So they have their strategies. Um, Stoic Challenge is another applied Stoicism book, only uh, what we're concerning ourselves is not with insults, but with life's setbacks. So a setback is whenever things don't go as you as you planned or as you thought they would, there's something uh, that uh, gets in the way of you uh, accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, life is full of setbacks, uh, little ones, where uh, you go down to have breakfast and you realize you're out of eggs. That's a minor setback. Big setback, a uh, doctor calls and says, I, I need to tell you something about the tests you've just, take, uh, you've just taken. You've got inoperable uh, brain cancer. You will be dead in two months. I hope a doctor wouldn't do that over the phone. But who knows? That's a huge setback. Uh, and then the question is, uh, how do you respond to setbacks? And the Stoics, it turns out, and in particular Seneca, actually, had a lot to say about how you should respond to setbacks. And, uh, 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 and modern psychology has also uh, kind of come into play here. Uh, uh, where they talk about you may not have power over whether or not you're set back, you're set back, but you have power over how you frame 
the setback. You can choose different frames. And some frames are going to make the setback worse, seem worse. And some um, frames are going to make the setback seem like almost nothing. Um, so I explore some of those frames. But it should be sort of like a universal book in that everybody experiences setbacks. And, uh, and then, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to say, guess what? They can actually be these interesting experiences that you can not only overcome, you can get some, um, derive some measure of satisfaction over uh, having overcome them. Uh, they can be a growth uh, kind of uh, experience for you. Uh, I even describe what I call a stoic training where you go out of your way to experience setbacks just so you can have those sensations of overcoming them and so you can improve your ability. You know, and again, for most people, well, that's just crazy. What, you're going to go out of your way to do things that, that are, are, are going to count as setbacks? And the answer is yeah. Um, and uh, Seneca uh, was, I think, of the... Of the uh, ancient of the Roman Stoics was the one who had the most to say about um, setbacks. Right. Um, Seneca said that uh, it seemed to him that there was no one who was more unhappy than someone who never faced adversity because right. uh, if you never face any kind of adversity, you're never able to test yourself. Yep. And, and on uh, that, we, we've just gone through, still going through a pandemic and a lot of talk about your biological immune system. Uh, and uh, what, does, uh, what do these vaccines do? Ah, they give your, uh, your biological immune system something to work on, to keep it healthy, to keep it strong. Uh, I would say that besides your uh, biological immune system, you've got a psychological immune system. And I'd make the parallel claim about that, that for it to be healthy and strong and effective, it needs to be irritated in various ways. So if you took a human being and you cut off all sources of setbacks, if you prevented setbacks from happening, or if they did happen, you said, don't worry, I'll fix it for you, that person is going to be so susceptible to the tiniest of setbacks that come along. Um, so you're actually, if you have a, a kid and you want the kid uh, to grow up uh, happy, healthy, well-adjusted, you shouldn't go out of your way to prevent any possible problems from happening and to take care of them when they do. Instead, you should say, you know what, um, he's going to face challenges and when he does, I can be helpful, but he's going to have to learn how to deal with challenges and he's going to have to learn that just because one comes along doesn't mean he's the most miserable person on the planet. It means he's a human being and he's got to adapt to that. Right. Everyone is uh, struck by adversity at one point or another or at many points. Um, <clears throat> and one way of looking at this too is that um, all of this stoic thinking about adversity, it's really about character building. Um, and they had this other thought as well that um, when you face adversity, you can actually create something positive out of it because of the way that you respond to it, if you respond to it in a virtuous way. Seneca has this line that dis disaster is virtue's opportunity because um, when something upsetting happens to you, you can respond to it in a virtuous way. And so that no matter how bad the situation is, if you respond to it in a virtuous way, you've actually taken a bad situation and found some good in it. And this is something that Seneca says, but you can find the same idea in Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius too. It's something that uh, they stress. Uh, Seneca says that uh, a Stoic takes uh, whatever, anything that's bad and turns it into good. And, so I find that to be very inspiring that really no matter uh, what happens to us in life, uh, we can always respond to it in a way that brings some kind of goodness in, into the world. Even if it's a terrible situation, if you respond to it in a, in a virtuous way and you display like a strength of character, that's a way of bringing goodness into the world. So I find that to be very uh, inspiring. 
Yeah. Um, Stoics have a, a strange take on failure. Uh, because they regard what normal people would call failure. They regard it, no, no, it's just a tuition payment as uh, part of an education. Um, so one of the things uh, the Stoic practice gives you is the ability, and this is the, the, the biggest theme in um, the Stoic Challenge book, is they teach you how to, how to bounce rather than breaking when you encounter a setback. They teach you how to fail and then learn from the failure, and then keep on going to make new, better failures. So for a Stoic, in a curious way, the number of failures is actually a positive metric. You know, and, uh, and, and then you look at history, you look at people that are regarded as uh, incredibly successful. Uh, loosen their lips with alcohol, <laughs> and you can get them to tell you this, you know, incredible stories of successive failures but they didn't break and they learned and they went on to succeed. So, um, and there are people, well, so part of stoic training is do something that's hard. How come? Because it's hard, meaning you're likely to fail. How come? Because if you fail, that's a valuable thing to do because you can learn from that failure and you get to practice bouncing back from that failure. There are people who never attempt anything hard because they fear failure. And that puts a straitjacket on them as far as developing their strength, their abilities, their ability to rebound by refusing to even flirt with the possibility of failure. They're guaranteeing that they're not going to succeed in some um, broader sense of the word. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I want to thank you, Bill, for this uh, wonderful conversation, and uh, I'm going to provide links to all of Bill's uh, books uh, below this video. So uh, do check out his books if you haven't already. And uh, if you did enjoy this video, please hit the like button, which will allow more people on YouTube to see the video. And if you'd like to see more stoic conversations like this, uh, please subscribe to the channel and uh, click the bell to receive notifications. Um, if you're watching this, I'd also like to invite you to sign up for a free mini course I have on the eight core ideas of Roman Stoicism. And you can find the link to that below this video as well. So um, thank you, Bill, uh, for this great conversation. Thank, and, thank you uh, so much. I've enjoyed talking to you and thank you for the invitation. And uh, hopefully we can speak in the future too. I hope so. Okay. Take care, and uh, it's been uh, wonderful speaking with you.